everything you give me it looks real good, but it is, it is bizarre. It is garbage. I'm not stupid, Chris. I read books. What are you talking about? I know about? what it's called. Disinformation. Counter espionage. What? You're back by the company. Oh, what have done? <laughs> CIA is going to fix your Oswald, and they've got one of me too, and that's all part of the plan. So it's okay. It's okay. So what happens next? You throw me in the wolves? You throw me in the wolves? Look, look at that. What's doing to you? It's huh? the only thing keeping me it's safe. It's killing you. It's the only thing keeping me safe. I don't know who my friends are anymore. I don't know who to trust. I don't know who to trust. Don't throw me to the wolves. The one who thinks he's being sold out there was Sean Penn as a courier for his friend Timothy Hutton, who plays a disillusioned file clerk who's been selling CIA secrets to the Russians. It's in a scene from The Falcon and the Snowman, one of four new movies we'll be reviewing on this week's Sneak Previews. I'm Jeffrey Lyon. And I'm Neil Gabler. As Jeffrey told you, we're going to take a look at The Falcon and the Snowman, which I think is one of the most entertaining pictures in ages. We'll also have Avenging Angel. That's the long-awaited sequel to Angel. <laughs> sure. And we'll review 1984, which is the latest movie version of George Orwell's famous novel and Richard Burton's last film. We'll also look at A Love in Germany, a new movie about Nazism from the Polish director Andrzej Wajda. And since it's going to be opening nationwide very soon, we're going to take a second look at a movie that Jeffrey and I both liked, The Killing Fields. And finally, Michael Medved will be awarding his golden turkeys to the worst movies of the month. Did you say long-awaited? I want to know by whom and why. <laughs> Avenging Angel is the unnecessary, that's the operative word here, the unnecessary <laughs> sequel to Angel, which you may recall cluttered movie screens last January. How could we forget? And just as Angel made a beeline to my worst films of 84 list, so too is a prominent place being reserved as we speak on my 85 Quinkers list for this one. Now played by Betsy Russell, they've changed actresses with little result, Angel, the one-time hooker, is now a law student, or preparing to go to law school, it's never really clear, when her guardian, a detective, is murdered by gangsters vying for control of Sunset Strip vice racket. Angel returns to the streets to track them down, of course, but she naturally needs help. So, disguised as a nurse, she springs an old street pal, a loony old cowboy actor from a mental hospital. Let me show you something. Remember this here? Lieutenant Andrews deputized me. Can't wait to see him. Dead, Kit. Oh. I mean, it's a damn shame. He was a good man. He was murdered. Well, then who in the hell would do a terrible thing like that? That's what we are going to find out. Word on the street is Johnny Glitter saw the whole thing. Do you know him? No, I'm sure I know. Funny little fellow throwing that sparkly stuff all over. Find him? You darn tootin'. Now let's ride. What an actress, huh? Beneath <laughs> the worst toupee I've seen in a long time is Rory Calhoun, <laughs> believe it or not. Later, Angel and her friends have cornered Mr. Big, head of the gang that committed the murder. And in this scene, he's kidnapped an orphan baby being cared for by one of Angel's street pals. And it's up to Angel to make her life or death decision. Move. Drop the gun. I'll throw that gun down before I drop it. You know I'll do it. Now kick it over here.
Andy can't wait to get off the set. Can you blame him? He's read the rest of the script. That's why he's crying. Well, the pretentious attempts to make some sort of social statement, which were everywhere in Angel, are not so strong here, thank goodness. But Avenging Angel is just as preposterous, uninteresting, and woodenly acted by its new star, and just as silly as Angel. Looking like it was edited furthermore with a rusty Vegematic with inappropriate music from what sounds like a Jerry Lewis comedy, Avenging Angel is riddled with non-stop cliches. Just about every other word of dialogue is predictable. You can yell out lines five or ten minutes before the actors do, and once again, Avenging Angel paints a distorted view of Sunset Strip street people as just lovable, colorful characters, just loads of fun. Avenging Angel is simple-minded, familiar B-movie fare, and here's hoping next January, Angel will finally leave us alone. Yes, this, I think Angel takes out her vengeance on the audience in this picture. Absolutely. The best thing you can say about this movie is that it's not your typical teenage sexploitation movie, because there's not very much sex in it, there's not very much exploitation in it. There's nothing interesting no, It's, it's really trying to be a kind of comedy thriller about how this ragtag bunch goes up against this mobster, but it's not funny, it's not imaginative, it's not even, and again, there's very little sex in it. It's not even good enough to be a second-rate TV cops and robbers show. You're right. There's nothing in it. The best feature maybe is Betsy Russell, the way she looks. <laughs> not the well, way even, she acts. <laughs> no, not the way she acts. Well, even though we're into 1985, 1984 still seems to haunt us, and we just got another movie version of George Orwell's famous novel, 1984, about a totalitarian society where feelings aren't allowed, where thoughts are crimes, where truth is false, and where Big Brother watches over everything and everyone. In this scene, though, one of the oppressed, played by John Hurt, has arranged a secret and illegal rendezvous with a female comrade. And I should tell you that the color in this scene may look a little washed out, but that was done by the filmmaker to create a sense of the lifelessness in 1984. Hello. Hello. Let me show you what I've bought. Real sugar, not saccharine. And I've got a loaf of bread, proper white bread, and jam. A real tin of milk. Look. Coffee. Real coffee. In a party, half a kilo. You managed to get hold of all this. Oh, there's nothing that don't have. Aren't you pleased? Yes. Yes, of course. Yeah, this is not your most action-packed movie. Now, meanwhile, Hurt has come under the watchful eye. Of course, all the eyes in this movie are watchful. But he's come under the watchful eye of his superior, played by Richard Burton. And Burton explains that the rebels who are fighting the authorities aren't an organized group. They're united only by a vague sense of liberty. They are not an organization in the sense we know. Nothing holds it together but an idea. There is no possibility of change in their lifetime. In the face of the fourth police, they cannot act collectively. Individually, they cheat, forge, blackmail, corrupt children, spread disease and prostitution. In the name of spreading knowledge from generation to generation. Until in a thousand years. You may find this of interest. Thank you. Hurt discovers that the book Burton gives him is actually the manifesto of the rebel leader, Goldstein. In accordance with the principles of doublethink, it does not matter if the war is not real, or when it is, victory is not possible. The war is not meant to be won. It is meant to be continuous. The essential act of modern warfare is the destruction of the produce of human labor. A hierarchical society is only possible on the basis of poverty and ignorance. In principle, the war effort is always planned to keep society on the brink of starvation. 
The war is waged by the ruling group against its own subjects. And its object is not victory over Eurasia or East Asia, but to keep the very structure of society intact. Rock fans might be interested that the music for the movie was written by the Eurythmics. Now you can see for yourself, I think, that this 1984 isn't an ordinary futuristic science fiction picture. What it's interested in is setting up a kind of nightmare vision of this dingy, drab society, a society that's really gone dead. And it does that very effectively, I think. But once the vision is set up, the movie doesn't do much with it. And the first 15 minutes are practically interchangeable with the last 15 minutes. It's two hours of depression. And it's ironic that the movie is almost exactly like the society it's depicting. It's got no juice to it, no life. And the result is that 1984 isn't only glum and depressing, it's also cold and dull. Absolutely right. The first hour oh, is... Oh, thank you. Well, but this time, <laughs> it's visually stunning. You really get into it. And John Hurt's performance is on point, and Burton is appropriately somber. I think the movie made the mistake of becoming a polemic, and it's merely a visual version of the book, without expanding it, without bringing a new dimension to it. You can get just as much by reading the book, and it also helps to enjoy the movie or endure the movie if you read the book in the way in to the, see the movie again. If you haven't read the book in years, it'll work that way well, much the dimension, better. Well, the dimension I think it doesn't have is the human dimension. It's None. intelligently made, but it's got no heart to it. It's got no humanity. And you really don't even find yourself as good as her is being involved with his plight too because little, the movie's so under dramatized. Too little on motivation, too much on total atmosphere. It works total atmospherically, but uh, other than that, you just don't understand. You don't care, what, and that's right. the bottom line that's of this. Right. You ought to care about these people. Well, here's a movie I cared about. It's our next film. It's called a, a, it's a political love story, I should say, called A Love in Germany. And it comes from Polish director and solidarity backer Andrzej Wajda, who made Danton and Man of Marble and Man of Iron. Now here, a man returns to his old village to learn who'd betrayed his mother there 40 years ago. Told mostly in flashback, a love in Germany recreates the forbidden affair his love-starred mother had with a Polish POW laborer while her husband is away at the war. And in this scene, in her grocery store, she makes little attempt to hide it. I have new kartoffels. Very good. Stani, give me some holen. Yeah. But Nazi law strictly forbade contact with prisoners, and soon a neighbor, coveting her grocery store, betrays the lovers, and eventually the man is condemned to death. in Germany is about two ordinary people there caught up and altered by fate. Pale, sad, Hannah Scheugler as the mother gives a stirring performance. Quiet yet powerful, giving in to her passion. She's a marvelous actress. She succumbs to temptation here and she pays the price. I found the lover's quiet desperation fascinating. They seem to know somehow that they'd be doomed. Theirs is a bizarre world where children suck on sugar-coated swastika lollipops while their frightened elders are all too eager to abide by racist laws enforced by Nazi fiends. And a love in Germany has moments of hope, strangely too, as when, for instance, Nazi authorities are trying in vain to make the Polish man Aryan, they call it Germanizing him, with a hideous medical exam to save the lovers from their fate, and more importantly, her soldier husband from dishonor. This is often an absorbing, laid-back, almost haunting film. I really liked it. 
Yeah, for me, I think it works really well when it's a love story. Yeah. Talking about this frustrated woman whose husband is away at war. There are even some very erotic passages in this movie without being slightly uh, pornographic. But when it becomes an indictment of Nazism, I think it becomes that. Just another indictment of Nazism. That's the second half. The second of half of the movie is much weaker than the first. It's as if they're saying, look, we set up this atmosphere in this world and we showed this fatalistic pair of lovers, and now we've got to tell you, oh, yes, Nazism was terrible. Well, we all know that. And that's where the film lags, I think. Yeah. But I think it's worth overlooking to see a marvelous performance I by like an it. actress on the verge of becoming an international star. She's an excellent actress. She is wonderful. And the world, Boy, isn't they, she? yeah, the world in which they live in is a beautiful little village, but they live in a hell on earth because it's run by Nazi laws. Yeah, I agree with you. I'd recommend this movie yeah. for the first half, the love story. I can't recommend it really for the second half, but I'm, I'm so on whole, okay. I'd say it's a good picture. Good. Well, this next movie we've got really had me on the edge of my seat. And the amazing thing is that it's a true story. It's called The Falcon and the Snowman. And that strange title refers to two California rich kids. One of them, played by Timothy Hutton, is into falconry. And the other, played by Sean Penn, is mainly into drugs. Now, Hutton, thanks to his father, who's a former FBI agent, gets a job at a high-tech defense contractor decoding top-secret messages. But when he finds out that the CIA is pulling all sorts of international dirty tricks, he decides to give the information to the Russians. And he asks his lifelong buddy, Penn, to act as the courier. Months pass, and secrets pass. And in this scene, Hutton tells his friend that he's had a change of heart, but Penn wants to continue. This is a business, Chris. We've got to expand. You're sick. Look, it's been nickels and dimes compared to the possibility. Where are you going? It's over, delivery boy. Hey, wait a minute. Get out of the way. Wait. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. I Xerox everything. Every cipher, every document. Yeah. Make you nervous? Well, don't worry, Chris. I'm not going to do anything with them as long as you're reasonable. Oh, you don't believe me? All right, go. Go ahead. Go. Now, Where are they? In a safe place. Where? In a safe place. You're lying. How about I give me your father? How did that be? Yeah, I give me a great FBI man. How do you feel about that? It's so be fine for your son. Leave my livelihood now, Chris. You can't just take this away from me. Yes? Hey, Joe, come with that. You had the merchandise? Yes, I did. My associate assures me that it is. Is he there with you? No. You still there, Alex? You'll be delivering it then. That is correct. The first Tuesday. That call is from the Russian Council. Now, Hutton has obviously decided that the risks are too high, especially since his buddy is something of a loose pistol taking drugs, and then bragging about being a spy. So as a final farewell to the whole treason business, Hutton arranges for one last transaction, going to the Russian embassy in Mexico City and giving them information about the U.S. satellite surveillance system. I want to make one last delivery. What do you think? Do you think I'm making this up as I go along? I'm not going down there anymore. I'm not asking you to. I'm going to do it. What? They are just waiting the whole time. Stringing you along to get to me. They don't need you anymore. They don't want you anymore. They want me. Well, I'm through with running. I mean, the thrill is gone. I'm going to go to court, face the music, do time, whatever. I'm going to be looking over my shoulder the rest of my life. And for what? There's never going to be any reconciliation. They're just as paranoid and dangerous as we are. Can't imagine why I thought they'd be any different. I'm going to get something out of this nightmare. They're going to want this. And they are going to pay. The frequency? Satellite. Perimeter. How much you can ask for? 100,000. You know, almost from the second this picture started, it had me hooked, and it kept me hooked. It's got a fascinating story to tell. It's got two interesting characters, and it's got two fine young actors, Hutton and Penn, playing them. They're really terrific. And unlike most spy movies, this one has got credibility going for it. It should. It all actually happened. The only weakness, I think, in that credibility is that the movie never really explains why Hutton turns to espionage, what motivates him. 
And that's obviously not exactly a small problem. But just on the basic level of sheer storytelling, just on that level, I think The Falcon and the Snowman is one of the most spellbinding, entertaining pictures in a long time. And to me, it's easily the best spy thriller in ages. Well, I wasn't enthralled the way you were, but I really think it's a good picture. I'm enthralled and on the basis of storytelling. But this I think tells John, a good story. I think John Schlesinger, who did Midnight Cowboy and Marathon Man and Darling, has the ability here to focus in on this young man who is a victim of confused motives. That's one of the reasons why we don't know for certain, I think, exactly yes. why he betrays his Which country. Which I think is unfortunate. But gets you to care about him in an odd sort of way. You hope he gets caught, and yet you know what he's doing is terrible, but you want him to get away. You, you are confused walking out of it, and that's the tragedy here. You wonder at the end, was it worth it of course not why did he do it i really felt for the for him i was glad when he was caught but i could see him being sucked into this morass yeah you do feel for him i yes, think that's it creates a very odd relationship with timothy hutton particularly in this movie you hope that there's still some redemption there and that's a very weird thing because you know he's giving secrets and, and you really care about his fate and it's exceptionally well acted it must be said by everybody including sean especially sean penn and yeah they are really wonderful and the, the main thing is you want to know what's going to happen that's next right. in this movie it never bored me not for a second it's a very very well crafted film too well now neil a special note speaking of well-crafted movies the academy award nominations are due out midday february 6th and one likely nominee is the killing field which is just opening now nationwide I picked it as best film of 84, and I think you should be sure to see it this week, before the rush to the box office begins. And this is a harrowing true story of how a New York Times reporter and his Cambodian aide covered the takeover of Cambodia by the brutal Khmer Rouge communists, and how the Cambodian later endured a hellish concentration camp before fleeing through a booby-trapped jungle. The Killing Fields is a thunderbolt of emotion, of brutality, and also of hope and courage. This was also on my 10 best list. I think it's one of the best looking movies of the year and best directed movies. Unforgettable. Of the year. Well, we just talked about one of the best movies of the year, and now Michael Medved is going to award his golden turkeys to the worst movies of the month. Michael? Thank you, gentlemen. When considering the golden turkeys of this holiday season just passed, we must start by giving dishonorable mention to films such as Supergirl, starring Helen Slater as a sort of affirmative action Christopher Reeve, a motion picture appropriately hailed by you, Neil, as, quote, an atrocity. And of course, there's Christy McNichol's saccharine sob story, Just the Way You Are, in which she plays a plucky polio victim who goes to the French Alps to pose as an injured world-class skier, a motion picture which you'll remember, Jeffrey, you praised as, quote, horrifyingly tasteless, unquote. But in addition to these gargantuan gobblers, there are two more leftover helpings of turkey, which you two lucky gentlemen haven't been forced to see. Thank you, Moose. One of them is Missing in Action, the new vehicle for America's favorite former karate instructor, Chuck Norris. Now, you may think the North Vietnamese won the war back in 1975. They certainly thought so. But just when they thought it was safe to go back in the jungle, here comes Big Chuck in a role that makes John Wayne in the Green Berets look like Mother Teresa. Norris plays a Vietnam vet who goes back to Southeast Asia for a nostalgic vacation, but decides, as long as he's there, to take on the entire Vietnamese army in order to rescue some of his old buddies who are still being held as prisoners of war. By the end of this incredibly predictable melodrama, we'll all feel like we've been held prisoners of war for about 15 years, because what's really missing in Missing in Action is action. Sure, we get a few boats blowing up, and a deviant Fu Manchu villain deciding he's finally ready to come out of the closet, but for the most part, we just see Norris looking angry and confused in long, dull, arid stretches that are about as exciting as watching paint dry, or about as exciting as our next movie, Toy Soldiers. In this picture, a bunch of fun-loving college kids and airline stewardesses on vacation in scenic El Salvador are taken prisoner by a right-wing death squad. Who's gonna save them? Got the greatest idea. We're going to go down there and get them out ourselves. <laughs> no, no. Who do you think I am? Clint Eastwood? No, we don't even think you're Chuck Norris. But that doesn't stop these airhead kids with adorable names like Monique and Muffy or their pals, including an heroic houseboy, an alcoholic ex-marine, and a black cowboy named Buck, played by Cleavon Little, who's obviously reprising his role from Blazing Saddles. This picture is a whacked-out combination of Woody Allen's Bananas, the macho hit Red Dawn, and Revenge of the Nerds. I want to go home. But you'll also want to go home, where for the same price as two tickets to either Toy Soldiers or Missing in Action, you could buy an entire year subscription to Soldier of Fortune magazine or, thank you, Moose, perhaps your very own Toy Soldier. 
So this is Michael Medved and friends saying bye for now. You gave me that sand worn from Dune. Somebody gave Michael Medved a toy soldier. Well, summarizing our opinions on the movies we reviewed this week, neither Neil nor I liked one single frame of Avenging Angel, the needless sequel to last year's movie about a student who doubles as a hooker to track down a killer. It's silly, unbelievable, predictable, and looks like it was edited with a rusty Vegematic. So two no's. And neither Neil nor I liked 1984, the newest version of the 1948 George Orwell novel. It's visually captivating, but like the society it depicts, it's absolutely lifeless. But we both gave mild approval to a love in Germany about a forbidden love affair between a German woman and a Polish prisoner of war. It's absorbing and quietly powerful, but eventually it does turn into a routine indictment of Nazi Germany. And finally, we agreed on The Falcon and the Snowman about a file clerk who sells CIA secrets to the Russians. Neil found it the most riveting movie he's seen in a long time, and I got to caring very deeply about the characters. So two yes votes, Neil. Yeah. Not a great movie, but a really entertaining movie. Right. I really liked it. Well, that's it for this week's sneak previews. Next week, we're going to take a special look at what may be the most popular subject in the movies today, aliens. And we're going to see what makes them so popular. So that's aliens next week on sneak previews. And until then, don't forget to save us the ILC. Thank you.